What's up my friends? In this video, I'm checking out this. The Tamron 28-75 f2.8 G2 zoom lens from a videographer's point of view. As ever, I'll look into its features, the build quality, the user experience, the value for money, and as ever, I like balance reviews, so there will be plenty of pros and cons. If you're new around here, I'm Harv, and I have lots of videos about videography and audio gear reviews and tutorials on my channel. So consider subscribing if you haven't already. I always get straight to the good stuff in these reviews, and these are not brought to you by any company or sponsor, except for maybe my Patreon subscribers. The idea with that, with my Patreon, is that any funds from Patreon go back into the channel to buy gear, I review it and then I give the gear to my backers. So if these videos help you and you like winning gear, do check it out, it's all linked below, it's just the cost of a cup of coffee. So moving on with the video, what is this lens? The Tamron 28-75 f2.8 G2 is Tamron's take on the classic standard zoom 24-70 to and by all accounts this second generation is a nice upgrade from the original, but I've not tried that one, so I'll just be reviewing it on its own merits. Can we just address the product name quickly? I mean, what kind of a name is Tamron 28-75 f2.8? Hold on. DI3 VXD G2. The obvious ones, we've got the brand, the focal range, the aperture. And G2, we know, means second generation, as I already mentioned. The less obvious ones, DI3, refers to the lens mount that the lens is designed for, in this case, Sony E-mount. And VXD stands for Voice Coil Extreme Torque Drive, which, by the way, the abbreviation should surely be VED, but I'm sure they have their reasons, never mind. And VXD is Tamron's highest end focus motor, so that's good to know. But do all of these abbreviations really need to be in the product title? Come on, lens manufacturers, let's make things more accessible. The field of view range is 75 to 27 degrees. Compare that to a 24 to 70, which is 84 to 35 degrees, and it's fairly similar. Personally, I'm drawn to longer lenses, so this is kind of welcome for me, but if you are into the, you know, using the wider end of your standard seam, I really think you'll notice the slightly tighter angle. It has 17 elements in 15 groups, including two special dispersion elements and two aspherical elements. These, of course, help with reducing flaring and ghosting and increasing contrast and that kind of thing. Next, onto build quality. And this is a real strength of this lens. First of all, the materials used are high quality throughout. It's just beautifully made. It weighs just 540 grams, sorry, American we're using metric and it's 12 centimeters long and at full extension we go to 14 so it's light and small which I like. It also has the weather sealing gasket so can be considered weatherproof which is awesome. The focus and zoom rings feel really nice and grippy in use and they're super smooth. There aren't any buttons on the barrel except for the one customizable button. Overall it's just a wonderful blend of being solidly made lightweight, compact, weatherproof, what's not to like? Next onto the user experience and first up is autofocus performance in video of course and snapping it on my camera I was kind of instantly impressed of you know remember we do have the high-end VXD focus motor from Tamron. I found it to be silent and just a nice blend of snappy and smooth in the way it transitions the focus point and that's using it on my Sony a7S III and a7 IV. But next, moving on to focus breathing performance. If you heard lens breathing and thought, what is this guy talking about? Well, lens breathing is where basically your field of view will change depending on the focal point. And this happens when usually you're using, you know, lenses that are designed for photography to film video. And that's why, you know, it's one of the many reasons why cinema lenses are so expensive. But as you can see, when we move the focus point from closest to infinity, the field of view barely changes at all at 28 millimeters or 75 millimeters. And this is great news for guys who are planning on using this lens for video. And just to show you what a horrible focus breathing lens looks like, this clip was taken from my Samyang 35mm f1.4 review that I did years ago, and yikes, not good. Next onto distortion and stills guys at this point are thinking, <laughs> distortion, who cares? 
Uh, of course, and they're right, they can just go in and, you know, and it's a one click in Lightroom and done, fixed. But of course in video, it's not that simple. We can correct for this kind of thing, but of course that means cropping in a little bit. And um, I don't know about you, I, I'm never that comfortable with cropping myself. Um, so taking a look at this lens, you can see there is some distortion on the wide end and nothing that noticeable on the longer end. I really think this will be less noticeable in most other shooting situations, but here's what it looks like with a little correction. I'm using Motion VFX M Film Look for this, which I reviewed in a previous video, and that's definitely worth checking out. Something that's not quite so easy to correct for in post is chromatic aberration. And zooming in here, I can't see any kind of sign of any chromatic aberration. Obviously, we're looking for that purple and green fringing, and this is all good news. As for detail, well, I don't really want to get too much into this, to be honest, because I find that um, as videographers, the lenses that you buy these days are all sharper and more detailed, they resolve more detail than we need them to as videographers, even if you're shooting in 8K. You may even find that people intentionally knock off a bit of digital sharpness from, you know, from very sharp lenses using lots of different techniques, which I've covered in previous videos. But needless to say, I was very happy with the level of detail from this lens. You know, it's a modern lens, what do you want? Also, the background, you know, blur, the out of focus areas, I, I thought it looked very good as well, even though I'd read before filming this that, you know, some people said that it had distracting bokeh. Um, I, personally, I don't see it, but, you know, let me show you some clips uh, and you can, you can judge for yourself. Next on to value for money and alternatives, and we'll start with the alternatives because that will give context and perspective to the value side of things. There are so many comparisons that we could make, but I've selected what I think are the most appropriate to look at from this kind of standard zoom range. Firstly, the Sony 24-70 G Master version 2. At well over two grand, it's a good lens, but subjectively not good value at all. It's also worth noting that whilst it had unanimous praise from people that had reviewed it, and come to think of it, those reviews came out on the, the day that the lens launched, which is a weird coincidence, I'm not sure what's happening there. But looking at DxO Mark, it scored a respectable 39 overall. Now, obviously this only takes optical performance into account, and there are always other features to consider, but a score of 39 puts it level with Canon's 135mm f2 lens, which came out in 1996. So make of that what you will. But next up we have Sigma's 24-70 f2.8, which is almost exactly half the price of the Sony, and I'd wager it's 90 eight or something percent as good. However, it's still pretty big, heavy, and more expensive than our Tamron. So those are things to consider, but a good lens, no doubt. But the next, and I'd say probably the best and most comparable lens to the Tamron is the Sigma 28 to 75 F 2.8 Contemporary. It's seriously tiny, it's super light at only 440 grams, and costs around 15% than the Tamron. Sure, it only has partial weather sealing, and reportedly the edges can sometimes feel slightly softer, and those are more things to consider, but from where I'm sitting, that looks like a serious bargain. And I really think that looking at those three comparisons, really kind of demonstrates how good the value is on the Tamron. You've got 
something that's optically great. It's built brilliantly, it's small, it's lightweight, it's got weather sealing. It's just a phenomenal bargain. Anyway, next onto the pros and cons, and I'll start with the pros, because I'm a glass half full kind of guy. So kicking off with the pros and value, obviously value, especially when you start comparing it to lenses like the Sony G Master Mark II. Next, the optical quality. I was really blown away throughout. I loved the detail, but especially I loved the amazing focus breathing performance. This makes it a really great lens for video guys to use. I found the autofocus to be superb, really snappy, really smooth in the way that it transitions, no complaints. The build quality I found really great. It's built to a high standard. The materials used seemed high quality as well. I'm not saying that it compares to the Sony G Master range, and this is certainly not a direct comparison, but for the money, I can't complain. I had a great time using this lens, so for the user experience side of things, this scores highly. It was just easy, and that's something that really shouldn't be underrated. Ease of use, something that gets out your way and just helps you create. That's what you want from all of your gear. Lastly, and I did already mention this, but I think it deserves its own pro, that focus breathing. I'm not sure how they did it, but impressive. And onto the cons, and there is a little bit of distortion, particularly at the wider end. It's actually not something I noticed at all until I got it into my studio and I was testing for the focus breathing. Just something to consider. You can correct it, but I, I don't want to if I can get away with it. I think it's worth considering resale value. It's not really something that I consider that much, but if you buy this lens new, I wouldn't expect much for it on the used market. However, this means you can snap up a bargain on the used market if you don't need to buy a new version. It has a non-traditional zoom range, albeit very similar, and I'm only adding this because it might upset some people. But for me, I didn't find this a con whatsoever. I just wanted to add it for something to think about. And that's kind of it. I really struggled to find more cons than this. Finally, to my opinion, and in short, it's really good. At first, I found the zoom range to be, you know, slightly unfamiliar. It's it's similar to 24 to 70, but after a bit, I really got used to it and I found I enjoyed the slightly longer reach. And I certainly think this shouldn't be something that should put you off. The whole thing is just beautifully designed and I've had a great time using it so far. What I would say is you should be proud to own this lens and even a little bit smug that you didn't go out and get the Sony G Master Mark II and didn't uh, drop that big wad of cash. One thing that I didn't yet mention is how good this lens is for gimbal use. It's small and lightweight, making it easy to balance, plus that zoom range is really useful. Yes, the barrel extends, and in the past this would have put people off using it for gimbal use because, you know, it could throw off your balance, but it's not 2016 anymore. Focus motors on, on modern gimbals are just so much stronger than they used to be, and I think any modern gimbal now will be up to the task. So buy this if you're a Sony user and you need a standard zoom lens, particularly if you value a lens being compact and lightweight and small and weatherproof and that kind of thing, and great value too. I'd actually recommend looking for this lens uh, to see if you can find a good copy used because you can get it, and I've, I looked this up beforehand, you can get them for around 40% of the RRP, and that is a steal. Don't buy this if you have more money than cents and insist on buying the Sony G Master Mark II. It won't improve your work in any kind of drastic way, and if you know your craft, you can get just as good results from this Tamron. Anyway, that's it for now. I just hope you found this interesting and helpful. I want to hear from you. Do you agree? What did I miss? What's your favourite standard zoom lens? And, you know, and which one should I check out next? I'll see you in the comments section below. I've now made over 300 of these videos about videography and audio, of which YouTube has recommended this video for you to watch next, and the one below is my most recent upload. Until next time, let's help each other out and shoot better video. See you guys. Mm -hmm.